as I say, Paradise Lost Book 2, we left off with a council in hell. It's very interesting that the first thing that uh, they do in hell is have a meeting. <laughs> uh, in heaven, they sing uh, songs of, and hymns of praise of God. In, uh, in hell, they have a meeting. If you've ever been in meetings, uh, you might find that vaguely funny or just think I have a bad sense of humor, in which case I, I can live with that. But they have a meeting. And what's the meeting there to do? It's to decide, to decide what they will do. Is another battle to be hazarded for the recovery of heaven? Will some advise it, others dissuade? And a third proposal, which Satan's already mentioned, let's not go back at God, let's go at the one who bears his image. We heard about him before we fell, but he's not yet been created. Note that Satan is not an eternal being. He has also been created, so he's heard about it back then. There's a, he has a sense of time and history. God is outside space and time. He sees past, present, and future. That's going to be clear when we go to book three. It'll talk about the, the eternal being of God, the uncreated being of God. People regularly, because of the romantics, confuse created being with uncreated being. Uncreated being is non-contingent being does not depend on anything else. God existed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit before he created the world and everything in it. So when the fall happens to the created order, the created order is affected. He is not. Because his being is not contingent on that being. His goodness is not uh, implicated in the fall. Otherwise it is, right? His being. They bear his image, yes, but they don't have his being. Adam and Eve are not gods, ever, never. They didn't lose their divinity, they don't get it back. They don't become gods, by the way, when you become a Christian, you don't become divinized. Sorry, you become humanized, fully humanized. You bear the image of the son, the, uh, the son as man. You don't become gods. You hear this in Christian circles, it's very troubling. But the co consult begins to go after that creature that they've heard about, but had not existed when they were in heaven before they got, they fell for nine days and then they lay there for nine days. It's happened now, surely. Because if God said it was going to happen, then it was going to happen. That, if God says it, it happens. So let's go after him. And then there comes the question of, because they'd heard that there was a prophecy or tradition in heaven concerning another world and another kind of creature equal or not much inferior to themselves. And about this time to be created. Their doubt, who shall be sent then? So then the question is, okay, well, who will go and do this? And there's a debate over this fact. In the end, the debate is pretty clear. It's Satan who's going to do the task of deceiving. And then they go on uh, and um, he goes upwards to the gates of hell. I'll deal with that in the text in a minute. But note the whole process here uh, is going to be mirrored. Uh, book two and three, I talked about the symmetries here. There's going to be a symmetry between book two and three. Uh, when there'll be a discussion in, the, in, in heaven as well in response to this. And there will also be a question because immediately the father says mankind's going to fall so you can see past, present, and future. And I'm going to show him grace. The father says it. Not the son. The father says it. And the son says, okay, this is the right. Of course, mankind's going to find grace because otherwise, and then he goes into a whole reason why it must be so. But who is going to do this then? says the Father, who is going to show him grace? Because there needs to be justice for the rebellion against me. There must be justice. Otherwise, he's no longer just. God has to do justice. But he's going to show grace. Well, how can he just, justice and mercy meet? A man must bear the sin. And this, the man who could do this is sinful, so he can't do it. He's going to die 
justly, but no grace has been extended. So the son offers himself at that point. But when the question is asked, there's silence in heaven. Just like there's silence in hell, when who's going to go forward and tempt mankind? All the angels are saying, oh, let's go after God. When it comes to, okay, who's going to go up and tempt mankind? They're all afraid, except one, Satan says, I'll do it. So there's a parallelism there. There's a consultation, a debate, a question, and then a silence. And then, and then the hero goes forward. Two heroes, Satan the hero of the devils, Messiah the hero of God. So which one's the hero? They represent the two sides, but which one's the hero? I mean, it's obviously Messiah. In which case, here we have his opponent, and unlike Virgil's Aeneid or Homer's epics, but it's or Homer's uh, Iliad, he's Hector, is Satan. But Hector in uh, Homer's Iliad is not a bad character. He's not evil. He's not opposed to the entirety of the human race. He's just in the other city. He's, he's Il Achilles' opponent. He's the opponent to Achilles' greatness. So he has to beat him. There can only be one of us who's going to be the greatest hero. That's the, that's the only reason that a Hector is despised. You're what's keeping me from being acknowledged as the greatest of all earthly heroes. That's, that's it. Satan, nothing like that. Another, another ground of dissimilarity is that Satan is a created being. And God is uncreated being. God is eternal. God is also omniscient and omnipotent and so forth. So it's not equal in, in a multiplicity of ways. So you could say, and this is how the romantics read it, well, it's not a fair fight. So how can the hero be involved in a beatdown of an opponent that can't fight? There's nothing heroic in beating down a, a little puny kid. This is God being a big bully. He's omnipotent. Of course he's going to win the fight. Right? We should be on the side of the underdog. Well, if you ignore the, all the other features there, then that, of course. There's only going to be one winner here. But how does he defeat him? Does he give him a beat down? And the answer is no. He defeats him by suffering and by being weak. To be weak is miserable, says Satan, doing or suffering. Messiah says to be weak is glorious. So it's not a beat down at all. The beat down, Messiah is beat down. He offers himself up to be beat down physically on the cross. So again, the, the, the readers of this who are with the romantics have not read very carefully. Or they just simply want to throw out the theology. As soon as you do that, the whole epic collapses. It loses its integrity and it makes no sense. You just simply can't make sense of it. I don't even care if you're a Christian in terms of the reading, but if you if you throw that away, the whole of the epic loses its, its, uh, its integrity. Makes no sense at all. C.S. Lewis is good on this in Preface to Paradise Lost as well. But I think I put that reasonably well. Anyway, let's go to the beginning of, the, of book two. High on the, a throne of royal state. It's interesting. Right, so Satan is immediately in. Remember, they at the end of book two, they had built or book one, they built built up pandemonium, and they immediately set Satan as a sort of a monarch there, or a tyrant, because they're all afraid of him. Set on a high in a throne of royal state, which far outshone the wealth of Ormus and of Ind, that is India, or where the gorgeous East with richest hand showers on her kings barbaric pearl and coal, gold. Satan exalted sat. Remember I said that the key phrase and uh, the, 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 the central point of the whole epic, book six, line, whatever it was, 670 thereabouts, Messiah ascends. He ascends. Well, what, Satan is exalted. He's now where he wanted to be. He's high and lifted up at the lowest place he could possibly be ever sat. By merit raised to that bad eminence. 
Who's Milton's hero? That bad eminence. And from despair thus high uplifted beyond hope, aspires beyond thus high insatiate to pursue vain war with heaven and by success untaught his proud imaginations thus displayed. Full of paradox. He appears all these things, the reality is the exact opposite. It's consistent, the consistent portrait of, Mil of Milton Satan. Everything that seems like this is actually the opposite. Even his belief that he has, he's reigning in any sense. Because he knows he has no power to do that. And he's going to hear it from his son a little later on. I'll, I'll get to that briefly. What is his great speech? Powers and dominions. Deities of heaven. For since no deep within her gulf can hold immortal vigor, though oppressed and fallen, I give not heaven for lost. From this descent, celestial virtues rising will appear more glorious and more dread than from no fall, and trust themselves to fear no second fate. Me, though just right, and the fixed laws of heaven did first create your leader, next free choice with what besides in counsel or in fight hath been achieved of merit. Yet this loss thus far at least recovered, hath much more established in a safe, unenvied throne, yielded with full consent. The happier state in heaven, which follows dignity, might draw envy from each inferior. But who here will envy whom the highest place exposes, foremost to stand against the thunderer's aim, your bulwark, and condemns to greatest share of endless pain? Where there is then no good for which to strive, no strife can grow up there from faction. For none sure will claim in hell precedence, none whose portion is so small of present pain that with ambitious mind will covet more. With this advantage then to union and firm faith and firm accord, more than can be in heaven, we now return to claim our just inheritance of old. Sure to prosper, prosper than prosperity could have assured us. And by what best way, whether of open war or covert guile, we must now debate. Who can advise may speak. So since we've lost everything good and nothing can be taken from us and we have been flattened out to the level ground so there's nothing left, of goodness in us. We are just evil. We lack all goodness. We can't go any lower. There's no, there's no possibility that somebody amongst us will become a little bit better than the others and will be envious and it will create dissension in the ranks. So the way we have conquered is by de destroying everything good and true and lovely and just. We have got rid of all of those categories. The political tactics of the communists and all totalitarians. I'll destroy your every good and then we will be free from everything bad. So they say. When all they do is destroy the good. But his claim there is that uh, they're going to be stronger because there's, there's no strength left in them, effectively. So it's an extraordinary argument. Nobody's going to claim precedence. He says this from the throne. And this is the, the terrific irony here. But you have to have a sense here of, of again, Christian theology and what is connected with good and evil is being and non-being. There's a non-being about Satan, even while he exists. He, he, he's, there's a lack of being in hell even, an absence of good, an absence of being. In a sense, he's nothing. And his political agenda is to annihilate everything. Remember, he, is, he was a murderer from the beginning wanted to murder God, couldn't do that, decided to murder his, his beloved creature, mankind. 
So he ceased, and next him Moloch, sceptered king, stood up, the strongest and the fiercest spirit that fought in heaven, now fiercer by despair. His trust was with the eternal to be deemed equal in strength, and rather than be less, cared not to be at all. With that care lost went all his fear. Of God or hell or worse, he recked not, and these words thereafter spake. So Moloch uh, is, a, uh, is a sort of a contrast with Belial, whom we're going to meet shortly here. And he's called a sceptered king. Um, the word in, in uh, Hebrew, Malak, um, is king. Moloch here is a sort of a king. Uh, represents a sort of kingly power. And it is just power then. It's power for power's sake. And what does he want? Well, he wants open war. My sentence is for open war of wiles more unexpert. I boast not. Let them let who's those contrive who need. If you need wiles, never mind my wiles. Let's go straight at them. Or when they need, not now. For while they sit contriving, shall the rest, millions that stand in arms and longing wait the signal to ascend, sit lingering here, heaven's fugitives, and for their dwelling place, accept this dark, opprobrious den of shame, the prison of this his tyranny who reigns by our delay? No, let us rather choose armed with hell, flames, and fury all at once, or heaven's high towers to force resistless way, turning our torturers into, into horrid arms against the torturer, when to meet the noise of his almighty engine he shall hear infernal thunder and for lightning see black fire and horror shot with equal rage again among his angels and his throne itself mixed with tartarian sulfur and strange fire his own invented torments so you can see <laughs> his hair is on fire and he wants right at him let's get straight at him no trickery no delay no counsel raging For perhaps the way seems difficult and steep to scale with upright wing against a higher foe. Let such bethink them. Again, he's just going to mock anybody who opposes anything other than what he says. Let such bethink them if the sleepy drench of that forgetful lake benumb not still, that in our proper motion we ascend up to our native seat. Descent and fall to us is averse. Who but felt of late when the fierce foe hung on our broken rear, insulting and pursued us through the deep with what compulsion and laborious flight we sunk thus low. The ascent is easy then. The event is feared. Should we again provoke our stronger, some worse way his wrath may find to our destruction. If there be in hell, fear to be worse destroyed. What can be worse than to dwell here, driven out from bliss, condemned in this abhorred deep to utter woe? where pain of unextinguishable fire must exercise us without hope of end the vassals of his anger when the scourge inexorably and the torturing hour call us to penance. More destroyed than thus, we should be quite abolished and expire. What fear we then? What doubt we to incense his utmost hour, which to the height and rage will either quite consume us and reduce to nothing this essential, happier far than miserable to have eternal being. So if he's going to just, if the, the result of all this is he annihilates us altogether so that there's nothing left, that's better than this. Let's let him finish the job then. Or if our substance be indeed divine and cannot cease to be, we are at worst on this side nothing. 
and by proof we feel our power sufficient to disturb his heaven, and with perpetual inroads to alarm, though inaccessible, his fatal throne, which, if not victory, is yet revenge. He ended frowning, and his look denounced desperate revenge and battle dangerous to less than gods. Now Belial comes forth, the exact opposite. Honey-tongued Belial. On the other side up rose Belial, an act more graceful and humane. A fairer person lost not heaven. He seemed for dignity composed and high exploit. Saruman speaking. Honeyed words, beware his voice. Here comes the gracious diplomat who speaks peace and counsels war. A fair person lost not heaven, he seemed for dignity composed and high exploit, but all was false and hollow. Though his tongue dropped manna, and could make the worse appear the better reason, to perplex and dash maturest counsels, for his thoughts were low, to vice industrious, but to nobler deeds timorous and slothful. Yet he pleased the ear, and with persuasive accent thus began. Milton does well here in not only presenting different counselors, but juxtaposing two who are the opposite extremes. Both are highly effective, by the way, as, as means of persuasion, that G him up and screaming, associate that with a certain type of leadership. Here's another type of leadership. This one's more dangerous, more effective more satanic. This is the path that Satan himself will follow. I should be much for open war, O peers. Now he speaks to them as nobility, the peerage, those who are aristocrats, as not behind in hate. If what was urged, main reason to persuade immediate war, did not dissuade me most, and seemed to cast ominous conjecture on the whole success. When he who most excels in fact of arms, in what he counsels and in what he excels, mistrustful, grounds his courage on despair and utter dissolution as the scope of all his aim after some dire revenge. First, what revenge? The towers of heaven are filled with armed watch that render all access impregnable oft on the bordering deep encamp their legions, or with obscure wing scout far and wide into the realms of night, scorning surprise. Or could we break our way by force, and at our heels all hell should rise with blackest insurrection, to confound heaven's purest light? Yet our great enemy, all incorruptible, would on his throne sit, unpolluted and the ethereal mold incapable of stain would soon expel her mischief and purge off the baser fire victorious. Thus repulsed our final hope is flat despair. We must exasperate the almighty victor to spend all his rage and that must end us. That must be our cure to be no more sad cure. For who would lose, though, though full of pain, this intellectual being, those thoughts that wander through eternity, to perish, rather, swallowed up and lost in the wide womb of uncreated night, devoid of sense and motion? And who knows? Let this be good, whether our angry foe can give it, or will ever. How he can is doubtful, that he never will is sure. Will he, so wise, let loose at once his ire and destroy us utterly? Is he really going to do that? 
be like through impotence or unaware to give his enemies their wish and end them in his anger, whom his anger saves to punish endless? Wherefore cease we then? Say they who counsel war, we are decreed, reserved and destined to eternal woe. Whatever doing, what can we suffer more? What can we suffer worse? He's, he's repeating the arguments that Moloch has just presented, right? And he says his opponent, his opponent in counsel. Is this then worst? Thus sitting, thus consulting, thus in arms? What when we fled amain, pursued and struck with heaven's afflicting thunder, and besought the deep to shelter us? This hell then seemed a refuge from those wounds. Or when we lay chained on the burning lake, so are we in a worse state than that? No, we're in a better state. That sure was worse. What if the breath that kindled those grim fires awake should blow them into sevenfold rage and plunge us in the flames? Or from above should intermitted vengeance arm again his red right hand to plague us? What if all her stores were opened and this firmament of hell should spout her cataracts of fire, impendent horrors, threatening hideous fall one day upon our heads, while we perhaps designing or exhorting glorious war, caught in a fiery tempest shall be hurled, each on his rock transfixed, the sport and prey of racking whirlwinds, or forever sunk under yon boiling ocean wrapped in chains, there to converse with everlasting groans, unrespited, unpitied, unreprieved, age, ages of hopeless end. This could be worse. <laughs> this could be worse. It could be worse than this. War, therefore, open or concealed, alike my void dissuades. For what can force or guile with him who, or who deceive his mind, whose eye views all things at one view? He from heaven's height, all these are motions vain, sees and derides. Sees and derides. Not more almighty to resist our, uh, our might than wise to frustrate all our plots and wiles. Shall we then live thus vile, the race of heaven, thus trampled, thus expelled to suffer here, chains in these torments? Better these than worse by my advice since fate inevitable subdues us, an omnipotent decree, the victor's will. To suffer as to do, our strength is equal, nor the law unjust that so ordains. This was at first resolved, if we were wise against so great a foe, contending and so doubtful what might fall. So let's just sit here. Better, we, get, we have a lot to lose. We lost that much, we can lose still more. I laugh when those who at the spear are bold and venturous, if that fail them, shrink and fear what yet they know must follow to endure exile or ignominy or bonds or pain, the sentence of their conqueror. This is now our doom, which if we can sustain and bear our supreme foe in time may much remit his anger. And perhaps thus far removed, not mind us not offending, satisfied with what is punished, whence these raging fires will slacken if his breath stir not their flames. Our purer essence then will overcome their noxious vapor or inured not feel. Or changed at length and to the place conformed in temper and in nature will receive familiar the fierce heat and void of pain. This horror will grow mild, this darkness light. Besides what hope the never-ending flight of future days may bring, what chance, what change worth waiting? Since our present lot appears for happy, though but ill. For ill, not worst, if we procure not to ourselves more woe. Thus Belial, with words clothed in reason's garb, 
counseled ignoble ease and peaceful sloth. Not repentance. Let's just accept it. And after him thus Mammon spoke. Was Mammon, I'm going to skip over Mammon. Let's dig, you know, this earth looks, you know, this ground looks promising. There might be some gold underneath here. Let's, 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 <laughs> let's see what we can find here. 270. Uh, this desert soil wants not her hidden luster, gems and gold, nor want we skill or art from whence to raise magnificence. And what can heaven show more? We can create a terrific palace. It'll be better than heaven. It's an entrepreneur. There we go. And he scarce had finished when such murmur filled the assembly as when hollow rocks retain the sound of blustering winds, which all night long had roused the sea. Now with cadence, hoarse cadence lull seafaring men or watched, whose bark by chance or pinnace anchors in a craggy bay after the tempest. Such applause was heard as Mammon ended and his sentence pleased, advising peace. For such another field they dreaded worse than hell. So much the fear of thunder and the sword of Mikael wrought still within them, and no less desire to found this nether empire, which might rise by policy and the long process of time in emulation opposite to heaven, which when Beelzebub perceived, then whom Satan, except none higher, sat, with grave aspect he rose, and in his rising seemed a pillar of state, deep on his front engraven deliberation sat, and public care, and princely counsel in his face, yet shone, majestic though in ruin, sage he stood with Atlantean shoulders fit to bear the weight of mightiest monarchies. His look drew audience and attention, still as night or summer's noontide air, while thus he spake. Thrones and imperial powers, offspring of heaven, ethereal virtues, or these titles now must we renounce and changing style be called princes of hell? For so the popular vote inclines here to continue and build up here a growing empire. Doubtless, while we dream and know not that the king of heaven hath doomed this place our dungeon, not our safe retreat beyond his potent arm, to live exempt from heaven's high jurisdiction in new league banded against his throne, but to remain in strictest bondage, though thus far removed under the inevitable curb reserved his captive multitude, for he be sure, in height or depth, still first and last will reign, sole king, and of his kingdom lose no part by our revolt. But over hell extend his empire, and with iron scepter rule us here, Psalm 2. And with this his golden, those in heaven. What sit we then projecting peace and war? War hath determined us, and foiled with loss irreparable, terms of peace yet none vouchsafed or sought, for what peace will be given to us, enslaved, but custody severe, and stripes and arbitrary punishment inflicted, and what peace can we return but to our power, hostility and hate, untamed reluctance and revenge though slow, yet ever plotting how the conqueror least may reap his conquest, and may least rejoice in doing what he most, we most in suffering feel. Nor will occasion want, n nor shall we need with dangerous expedition to invade heaven, whose high walls fear no assault or siege or ambush from the deep. What if we find some easier enterprise? There is a place if ancient and prophetic fame in heaven e'er not, another world, the happy seat of some new race called 
man. About this time to be created like to us, though less in power and excellence, but favored more of him who rules above, so was his will pronounced among the gods. And by an oath that shook heaven's whole circumference, confirmed, thither let us bend all our thoughts to learn what creatures there inhabit, of what mold or substance, how endued, and what, and what their power, and where their weakness, how attempted best by force or subtlety, though heaven be shut, and heaven's high arbitrator sit secure in his own strength, this place may lie exposed, the utmost border of his kingdom, left to their defense who hold it. Here, perhaps, some advantageous act may be achieved by sudden onset, either with hell fire to waste his whole creation, or possess all as of our own, and drive as we were driven, the puny inhabitants, or, if not drive, seduce them to our party, that their god may prove their foe, and with repenting hand abolish his own works. This would surpass common revenge and interrupt his joy in our confusion, and our joy upraise in his disturbance, when his darling sons hurled headlong to partake with us. With us shall curse their frail originals and faded bliss, faded so soon. Advise if this be worth attempting. Or to sit in darkness here, hatching vain empires. Thus Beelzebub pleaded his devilish counsel. First devised by Satan, and in part proposed, for whence, but from the author of all ill could spring so deep a malice to confound the race of mankind in one root and earth with hell to mingle and involve done all to spite the great creator but their spite still serves his glory to augment this is milton's interjection right so there's an editorial comment or an authorial comment by milton again if you're in any doubt about what the, the whole theme and structure and of the whole plot, it's clear along, so there's no way of making it uh, anything other than what it most plainly is stated. The bold design pleased highly those infernal states and joy sparkled in all their eyes. With full assent they vote, whereat his speech he thus renews. Well have ye judged, well ended long debate, synod of gods, and like to what you are. Now he taught, calls them a synod. A synod is a, an ecclesiastical term. He, he's, ma he's making a, a reference here to um, church councils, which act against godly wisdom. And he's seen them. Great things resolve which from the lowest deep will once more lift us up. In spite of fate, they keep referring to fate. Again, fate is a pagan concept from, uh, the, from uh, the pagan ideas of um, polytheism, and they claim to be gods. So there is one thing among the of the gods, we're immortals, and that is fate. And fate rules above God. God simply has omniscience, omnipotence, <laughs> all those things. In other words, he's the very contradiction of fate. Fate and God, uh, as the Bible presents God, cannot coexist. There is no, there's either fate or, there, or there's God. And, and the, the, these demons who call themselves gods keep referring to fate because that is the natural implication of them uh, claiming to be gods. Near our ancient seat, perhaps in view of those bright confines, whence with neighboring arms an opportune excursion we may chance, re-enter heaven, or else in some mild zone dwell not unvisited of heaven's fair beam secure, and at the brightening orient beam purge off this gloom, the soft delicious air to heal the scar of these corrosive fires. But then he's going to go on, let me come to this because I spent too much on time. Satan then speaks. 
and his look. Um, and then the, 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 question, the, the grand question, whom shall we send? Here I am, Lord. <laughs> whom shall we send? Here we had no need of all circumcision. We had no less choice in our suffrage. Whom shall we send? For on whom we send the weight of all and our last hope relies. This said he sat and expectation appeared to second or oppose or undertake the perilous attempt, but all sat mute, pondering the danger with deep thoughts, and each in other's countenance read his own dismay, astonished. None among the choice and prime of those heaven-warring champions could be found. Milton's mocking them. So hardy is to proffer or accept alone the dreadful voyage, till at last Satan, whom now transcendent glory raised above his fellows with monarchal pride, conscious of highest worth, unmoved thus spake. O oh, progeny of heaven, imperial thrones with reason, hath deep silence and demur seized us, though undismayed. Long is the way and hard that out of hell leads up to flight. Our prison strong, this huge, Convex of fire, outrageous to devour, immures us round ninefold, and gates of burning adamant barred over us, prohibit all egress. These past, if any past, the void profound of unessential night receives him next, wide gaping, and with utter loss of being threatens him, plunged in that abortive gulf. If thence we he scape into whatever world or unknown region, what remains him less than unknown dangers and as hard escape? But I should ill become this throne, O peers, and this imperial sovereignty, adorned with splendor, armed with power, if aught proposed and judged of public moments in the shape of difficulty or danger could deter me from attempting. Therefore do I assume these royalties and do not refuse to reign. Refusing to accept as great a share of hazard as of honor, do alike to him who reigns, and so much to him do of hazard more as he above the rest high honored sits. Go therefore, mighty powers, terror of heaven, though fallen, intend at home, while here shall be our home, what best may cease the present misery or ease it, and render hell more tolerable, if there be cure or charm to respite or receive or slack the pain of this ill mansion. Intermit no watch against the wakeful foe, while I, abroad, through all the coasts of dark destruction, seek deliverance for us all. He's going to be the deliverer. He's the redeemer of hell, right? So again, parallelism here. He's going to, he's going to uh, wreak redemption for the devils. How? This enterprise none shall partake with me, thus saying, rose the monarch and prevented all reply. Prudent, lest from his resolution raised, others among the chief might offer now, certain to be refused, what erst they feared and so refused might in opinion stand his rivals winning cheap the high repute which he through hazard huge must earn. But they dreaded not more the adventure than his voice forbidding. And at once with him they rose. They're afraid of Satan. That's what drives them. Same portrait that we find in Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. They are terrified of Sauron. That's what drives the wicked foes. Not goodness, truth, beauty, but fear. They're driven by evil motives. The motivation for them is always negative. He keeps peace in the ranks simply through fear. He is a tyrant. And so uh, towards him they bend with awful reverence prone, and as a god extol him equal to the highest in heaven, nor failed they to express how much they praised, that for their, the, the general safety he despised his own. For neither do the spirits damned lose all their virtue, lest bad men should boast their specious deeds on earth, which glory excites, or close ambition varnished, or the zeal. Thus they their doubtful consultations dark ended, rejoicing in their matchless chief. As when from the mountaintops, epic simile, as when from the mountaintops the dusky clouds ascending, while the north wind sleeps, or spread heaven's cheerful face, the lowering element scowls over the darkened landscape, 
snow or shower. If chance the radiant beam with farewell sweet extended as evening beam, the fields revive, the birds their notes renew, and bleeding herds attest their joy, that hill and valley rings. Oh, shame to men. Milton, the voice of Milton. Oh, shame to men. Devil with devil damned firm concord holds. Men only disagree of creatures rational. Though under hope of heavenly grace, and God proclaiming peace, yet live in hatred, enmity, and strife among themselves, and levy cruel wars, wasting the earth, each other to destroy, as if, which might induce us to accord, man had not hellish foes enough besides, that day and night for his destruction wait. So again, he takes this and applies it now to the whole human race. He's not talking about uh, any particular human being, but the nature of human nature, we war against each other as if our foes were not spiritual powers. We, against, we wage war against flesh and blood. What are we doing? Right, this is true valor in Christ, but this is also true wickedness, that we should do the devil's bidding by killing one another. I'll, I'll finish off there. I wanted to actually get to uh, the end of book two, but I'll do that next time, and uh, we'll pick it up. I want to show a, a little a reunion of sorts.